I am pleased to be with you, and I thank uh, Abu Kambani for inviting me to deliver this lecture and to meet uh, this respectable group of uh, expert gynecologists and health uh, professionals. Okay, did you see a patient in your clinic with these expressions and motions? Did you see a patient come to you and making these views? Actually, when you are working in the field of infertility, most ladies come back to you after failure of your medical treatment for induction or IVF or ICSI, and the lady will be worried and angry and anxious. Why I did not get pregnant? You told me my ovulation is excellent, my fallopian tubes are patent, my husband's analysis is okay, everything is okay, my hormonal profile is normal. Why I did not get pregnant? You have to answer me. You are my doctor. You have to answer me. And this is a common question by ladies. So the answer comes that I did not tell you that all of you lottery ladies will get pregnant. The pregnancy rate is not 100%. If it is 100% in the human beings, this means that you will not uh, be able to walk in the street because of a lot of people. So the high ovulation rate, normal fallopian tubes, normal semen analysis does not guarantee full pregnancy or 100% pregnancy because there are some items we did not study in your body, which include fertilization. We did not examine your fertilization unless you will have in vitro fertilization. We did not examine antibodies in your body or in semen. And we did not examine the implantation of the embryo inside the endometrial cavity. These are the missed issues when I am treating you as an infertility case. And you have to know that the uh, possibility or the ability to get pregnant is called fecundity or fecundability rate. And the fecundability rate in the human beings is just 25 to 30 percent. And the rest of cases will not get pregnant. And two thirds of the failed pregnancy or fecundability of the human beings is attributed to the endometrial factor. The endometrial uh, receptivity is not good, the effective implantation is not good, and the defective implantation is responsible for abortion, for infertility, for recurrent pregnancy loss, for preeclampsia, and for uh, IGR as well. <clears throat> and we have to tell the patient that implantation requires a triad of an excellent blastocyst, receptive endometrium, and good dialogue and communication between the endometrium and the blastocyst. And this triad occurs in a time and site specific manner. Time and site specific manner. Regarding this time, not all time, the lady is liable to have a baby. This time is called implantation window, which is six to 10 days after ovulation in many publications, maybe uh, day 15 to 22 in a 28 cycle or other definitions. But at this window of time, you are liable to have a baby. Before this time and after this time, you are not liable to have a baby. So this is the importance of time. And the endometrium will have some change for this purpose. The second issue for implantation is the site. The embryo should be implanted in a specific site in the uterus, which is measured to be five millimeters on the posterior wall mid-sagittal plane as diagnosed by office hysteroscopy, as mentioned in many publications. So she will say, okay, you have to study the endometrial receptivity for me. You told me it is responsible for two thirds of failure. So I need to know what is the problem inside my endometrium, the implantation side, I need to study it. Okay, I will do for you a very important and very valuable test, which is called uh, endometrial receptivity uh, analysis test, ERA test. She says, okay, go ahead.
But you have to know that this test, we will take an endometrial sample from your endometrium, pre-ovulatory, and we will send it to the lab to study the genes of your endometrium. We will study up to 200 genes and to say your endometrium is good, ready for implantation or not. She says, okay, go ahead. But mind you that this test is very expensive, $1,000 for a case. It gives information about this cycle only, does not give you information about subsequent cycles. And its results are not consistent with progesterone level. So it is not applicable for you. And most importantly to know that we will not transfer embryos for you in this cycle. Why? Because we took a sample from your endometrium. What to do for my eggs? You took from me 10 eggs or 15 eggs. Oh, you, we will take it to the lab, fertilize them, and make what's called freeze all strategy for you. So she will stand and say, no, this is not a practical test, as recommended by recent publication, that it is doubtful to be valuable in clinical practice for all of us. So what you will do, doctor, this test is not applicable, it's not practical for me. You should search for a similar way to assess my endometrial receptivity. You will say, oh, I'll do for you very easy and very simple, applicable, affordable, available tests, which include testing of the endometrium by transvaginal ultrasound, testing the hormonal profile, and sometimes I can use uh, diagnostic hysteroscopy for you to assess endometrial receptivity and to answer you is your endometrium is ready for implantation or not. She says, oh, go ahead. This is a good achievement. The first item for assessing the endometrial receptivity is to measure the endometrium by ultrasound. And you know that the endometrium has two main layers. Zona gizalis and zona functionalis. And zona functionalis is formed of zona compacta and zona spongiosa. And these layers are supplied by spiral arteries, as you know. And by ultrasound, at the pre-ovulatory time, at the pre-ovulatory time, the endometrium will have characteristic trilaminal appearance. All of us know it. And this trilaminal appearance comes due to the reflection of the zona functionalis on itself, making the echogenic midline due to reflection of the endometrium on itself. If I see the trilaminal appearance in the preoperatory period, this means that your endometrium is good and you are liable to have a baby. And the, uh, the societies are interested in infertility, including Canadian and the SRM and others, recommended that if you measure the endometrium for the endometrial thickness, you should measure from the near to the fundus and the thickest part of the endometrium. This is number one. The second recommendation is to make the transducer perpendicular on the uterus. If it is transabdominal, it should be perpendicular. If it is transvaginal, it should be perpendicular. The third recommendation, if you find any fluid, inside the endometrium, you have to exclude it from calculation of the endometrial thickness. Why are these sophistication to measure the endometrium to be near to the fundus, to be thickest part, to be perpendicular, to avoid any fluid inside the endometrial cavity? These sophistications come due to, uh, we rely on the endometrial thickness for assessing endometrial receptivity as a predictive of endometrial receptivity. They mentioned that if you find endometrial thickness seven millimeter or less, this is bad endometrium. If it is eight millimeter or more, this is good endometrium. So if you find the endometrium is seven or less uh, millimeter, you have to, uh, this is pre-ovulatory, it's HCG day, pre-ovulatory. You have to sit down with the couple and tell them that I found the endometrium is seven millimeter or less, and this carries poor prognosis to have a baby. So you have the choice. I give you the ball in your uh, uh, board. If you prefer to continue induction or continue assisted reproduction, it's your responsibility. 
I, tell, I told you that pregnancy rate is less than normal if the endometrium is seven millimeter or less. So number seven, we hate this number, seven or less. But if you find the endometrium eight, nine, 10, 11, this is good with high probability of having pregnancy as documented in many studies like this study published in Fertility Sterility. So if you find the endometrium is seven millimeter or less, what to tell for the patient? You have to sit down with the couple and tell them this truth, this number one. Number two, you have to counsel them to cancel the cycle. She says, you took a lot of eggs from me. What to do? I'll do freeze-all technique. So this is the first indication for freeze-all strategy because if I transfer the embryos to you and endometrium is seven or less, the pregnancy rate will be lower than expected. This is number one. Number two, I have to think for estrogen, in estrogen, because estrogen is the cause of thin endometrium, and I can try treatment, putting in mind that the evidence is not uh, so strong to support the role of estrogen therapy, until we got good endometrium, eight or more, and we can make transfer again of the embryos. And the studies all over the world found that Doing hysteroscopy for ladies with thin endometrium is the only uh, uh, is the only evidence-based valuable approach in those cases. So don't forget, forget to offer your patient just office hysteroscopy with thin endometrium to check what is the uh, status, what is the nature of her endometrium, and to take a biopsy to exclude some inflammation of the endometrium. And of course, freeze-all strategy is valuable as proved in many studies. And this very nice table, and this is your article, you will find the rescue strategy of freeze-all is offered for patients with uterine or tubal abnormalities. Uterine is thin endometrium, tubal is unpredictable hydrosalmics discovered at the day of uh, egg retrieval. On the other hand, if you find endometrium, no, normal thickness or more than normal, which is called thick endometrium. So more than, uh, than uh, eight or nine or 10, this is thick endometrium. If you find endometrium thick, you have to think of pregnancy because your patient may have irregular cycles and she's PCO patient, for example. So this is pregnancy. If you find a thick endometrium, you have to ask for beta HCG. This is number one, okay? So we have to exclude pregnancy. If she is not pregnant, what are the causes? The causes may be uh, wrong calculation. Again, you took, you, you measure ultrasound pre-ovulatory, and this is not pre-ovulatory time for the patient. It is post-ovulatory, it is a secretory phase, so the endometrium is thick, particularly in patients with irregular cycles, BCO patients and others. So don't ignore that the calculation is wrong. This is the most common cause of non-pregnant causes of thick endometrium. Others include intrauterine adhesions, which make thick endometrium, but with irregularities, as you know. Also, endometrial hyperplasia is a cause of thick endometrium, particularly in patients with BCO. These are the possible causes of thick endometrium. How to treat? Treatment is causal, of course, and again, hysteroscopy is valuable, and biopsy as well. Can we uh, send our patients with abnormal endometrium to do 3D ultrasound? Yes, we can. But does it add a lot of values? No, it does not add a lot of values. It just evaluates the endometrium uh, like 2D ultrasound, but adding the uh, endometrial uh, volume and adjusted endometrial volume, which measures the volume of the uterus and uh, subtract endometrial volume from it. These are valuable additions, but not yet proved in the studies. So we evaluated the endometrium. We spent a lot of time evaluating the endometrium. Is it thin or thick? Okay. The second point, I will uh, check if the endometrium is healthy or unhealthy. How the endometrium is unhealthy? If it is inflamed. We have two types of endometrial inflammation with endometrites. We have chronic endometrites and acute endometrites. Chronic endometrites is diagnosed by 
chance when you do, when you make an endometrial biopsy and send it to the lab, it will show plasmocyte uh, infiltration in the stroma, but usually the patient is asymptomatic. When to ask for chronic endometritis, it is not recommended in literature to make it a routine for all ladies, but it can be offered for patients with unexplained recurrent pregnancy loss or unexplained uh, failed IVF XZ cycles. And some studies recommended antibiotics, particularly fertility serenity publications, particularly doxycycline as a treatment of chronic endometritis. You can uh, give your patient a chance to be assessed by hysteroscopy. In such a case, we can find endometrial abnormality in the form of strawberry appearance or micro polyhy suggestive of chronic endometritis as found in this publication. On the other hand, if the patient is suspected to have acute endometritis, the story is different because acute endometritis is a part of PID, so it should be symptomatizing. And of course, all of you uh, know CDC criteria for assessing PID uh, 2015 and modified in 2021. And if you take a biopsy from a patient who has acute endometritis, you will find microabscesses in the stroma in addition to a lot of neutrophil infiltration. And I discussed this topic of endometritis in one of the book chapters recently published by uh, myself and a team from the United States, which is entitled Pelvic Inflammatory Disease, an underestimated serious health problem. You can find it on the internet. Don't ignore the role of bacterial vaginosis. If you suspect that the patient has bacterial vaginosis by positive AMSIDS criteria, don't ignore to treat the patient and to diagnose and to treat bacterial vaginosis as a cause of this defective implantation or irreceptive endometrium. And of course, you will find a few electrobacilli and high anaerobes, particularly gardenerella. And again, I discuss this topic in a book on infertility and infection, which is called Genital Infection and Infertility is Free of Charge on the Internet. So we studied the endometrial thickness and ecogenicity. We studied that the endometrium is free of inflammation. Now, what about the endometrial cavity inside, which is the site for implantation? Is the cavity morphologically free or not? So, here comes the rule of Mullerian duct anomalies. Sometimes the cavity is deformed due to Mullerian duct anomalies, uh, particularly septate uterus, subseptate uterus, uh, bicornuit uterus, unicornuit uterus, and others. In a recent publication of the American Society, 2021, they changed the uh, American Fertility Society classification, 1982-88, and they mentioned strictly that uh, the causal relationship between Mullerian duct anomalies and infertility, particularly septum, is uncertain, according to publications. But in practice, we see a lot of patients with septate uterus, and we offer them metroplasty. What to do? The recommendation of the societies are very sharp that the relationship is uncertain. I advise you, if you have a patient with uterine septum and unexplained infertility for a long time, despite everything's okay, or unexplained recurrent pregnancy loss, or unexplained repeated failures of IVF, you can offer her metroplasty, provided it's done in a microsurgical way, and there is complete difference between microsurgical metroplasty and metroplasty, and you have to avoid complications, and you have to be an experienced hysteroscopist to avoid complications. I performed laparoscopy for many cases uh, subjected to hysteroscopic metroplasty and they found a lot of adhesions, even colon and this intestinal adhesion to the uterus. So the recommendation that endoscopic explanation of unexplained infertility also again is free of is free on the internet in this book chapter. What about the bicornet? The same applies. Bicornet is not correlated or unicorn is not correlated to uh, uh, unexplained infertility. And the conclusion of this part, that no definite relationship of Mullerian duct anomalies to infertility. Okay, the cavity is morphologically free, but sometimes it has a pathology. 
How can we exclude the pathology in the cavity? This can be done by hysteroscopy and transvaginal sonography. In this case, you can find a submucous myoma. I have to remove the myoma because it may be the cause and the hysteroscopic myomectomy is done in a morselation technique or sizing technique as you can see in this movie and we remove the myoma type 0 and the bulging part of type 1 and 2. But is this myoma the cause of infertility or not? This is the story comes from the investigations and come from research and the research, the evidence, mentions that the relationship of submucous myoma to infertility is doubtful. There is insuff insufficient evidence despite a lot of studies supporting hysteroscopic myomectomy in cases of infertility or even the current pregnancies. My advice, the same. If you don't find any other cause, proceed to hysteroscopic myomectomy and it would be microsurgical or fertility-oriented myomectomy rather than conventional hysteroscopic myomectomy. And again, Cochrane reviews uh, mentioned there is uncertainty to find the relationship with the myoma and infertility. What about endometrial polyp? Commonly we see endometrial polyp by transvaginal sonography. We have to know that endometrial polyp should be either persistent or transient. Transient, when you see a small polyp, one centimeter or less, you can make follow-up of the lady and subsequent uh, follow-up visits, you will see the polyp disappears, particularly after menstruation. And this occurs in around 27% of cases. But if the polyp is persistent, and you have to proceed to polypectomy to make the cavity free, this is logic. And uh, the American Fertility Society found some correlation, particularly in cases with repeated IVF failure. And of course, polyp can be treated by hormonal treatment for C course, C recycles by progesterone, or by hysteroscopy. Last intrauterine pathology is intrauterine cyanechia or adhesions. And of course, adhesions uh, have different relationship to infertility and recurrent pregnancy loss. This is evident in all applications. And the treatment is hysoscopic adhesolysis, you know, grade one up to uh, four. You can excise the, uh, the uh, adhesions by using uh, micro scissors, like in this case, or rigid scissors, or septoscope, according to the stage of uh, uh, adhesions and according to the availability and according to your expertise. And you have to offer your patient uh, estrogen therapy to allow the healthy endometrium to creep and to cover the raw areas that were covered by adhesions. And you can put an intrauterine balloon. Uh, and most importantly, to do a second and early second log hysteroscopy to cut any fine adhesions formed after a good procedure. So we studied the endometrium and is it healthy or not, the cavity and pathology. Last point to be studied uh, regarding the endometrial receptivity is to assess the progesterone level. You know progesterone is the hormone of uh, the second half of the cycle. If the progesterone has defective levels, particularly rise preoperative, pre-ovulatory rise, or after ovulatory decline, this will affect endometrial receptivity. So we will look to progesterone from two scopes. If it shows rise pre-ovulatory or decline in the luteal phase, this is very important for us as infertility specialists. And if it rises, Prior to ovulation, this is called premature progesterone rise, and this has a, del a deleterious effect on pregnancy. It, it is associated with decreased fertility and pregnancy rate. What is the level pre-ovulatory? It should be one nanogram. Some studies mentioned 1.5, 1.7, but generally speaking, should be in this range. If it reaches two nanogram, this is a contraindication for embryo transfer. Two nanogram pre-ovulatory, at the day of HCG, if you measure prostaglandin uh, progesterone and find it 2 nanogram or more, this is a contraindication for embryo transfer because pregnancy rate will be low as high level of progesterone at this time will lead to asynchronization between the embryo and the endometrium, as mentioned in many publications. What is the cause of this premature progesterone rise? The cause is you as a doctor. Why? 
you gave your patient high dose of FSH and each follicle will have secretion of progesterone so you give her a good amount of FSH alone this leads to production of progesterone and this high progesterone will accumulate pre-ovulatory and will lead to poor pregnancy what to do the solution is to from the beginning of induction you should add LH to FSH LH will lead, will, will make the progesterone change it into androgens and androgens will be taken by granulosa cell to be changed into estrogen so it will get rid of this excessive progesterone and it is recommended that you use dose of FSH to LH by 0.3 to 0.6 which means 0.3 LH and 0.6 FSH and there is a controversy regarding patients with PCO you know PCO uh, has another story and another uh, problem so this is the solution but if you are confronted with a case with high progesterone level at the day of HCG you have to sit down with the patient and her husband and tell them that the, this patient has high progesterone and we have to either to cancel the cycle and make freeze all strategy or to make embryo transfer it depends upon your opinion because at this time the transfer will carry uh, lower uh, uh, pregnancy rate and here again the same table elevated progesterone at triggering is one of the rescue strategies for uh, for uh, freeze all and it is recommended that you have to wait until day five if you measure the uh, progesterone and found it more than 1.75 you have to cancel and make freeze all. Last point of progesterone affection of the pregnancy is progesterone deficiency. All of us know what's called the luteal phase defect. And all of us studied in the faculties of medicine that luteal phase defect is delay of the endometrial maturation two days or more beyond the menstrual day. As the patient has menstrual day 20, for example, the endometrium will be 17 or 16 and so on. And this is histopathologic diagnosis. And the histopathologists, since a long time, working over these cases and writing, this is day 15, day 16, and so on and so on. Unfortunately, this histologic diagnosis of endometrial dating is uh, debated recently. And the conclusion of the American society recently omitted endometrial dating. Don't send any patient for endometrial dating don't send because the histopathologic diagnosis is not recommended is not recommended due to inconsistency of the results of dating and so on so on. so please don't send your patient for dating as I recommended by the American society last year uh, and the diagnosis relies and the American fertility society or American society of reproductive medicine mentions that the tail phase effect is a clinical diagnosis it is not histopathologic diagnosis it's not hormonal diagnosis, it is a clinical diagnosis of short luteal phase. If it is 10 days or less, this is luteal phase uh, defect according to its definition. And all the diagnostic measures, including length of cycle, level of progesterone, combination, and mutual dating, are very uh, doubtful. So, luteal phase deficiency is a disease without a reliable diagnostic test. If we don't have a diagnostic test for the tail phase defect, how can we treat it? We don't have a reliable diagnosis. And here comes the American uh, uh, word that catch 22, which means how to treat a case. We don't, we don't know how to diagnose. You know, in America, some virus sent letters to the authorities that I need to examine my mental status to see if I am uh, normal or not. The, uh, the responsible is not to the, uh, the, this request. This has been refused in, uh, uh, in this file, Catch-22. How to assess that you are, uh, no, your, your mental status is normal or not? And you wrote this by your hand. You, you, sh you should be normal if you write this sentence. And Catch-22 applies for your tail phase defect. So we don't have diagnosis. But the treatment for it is empirical without randomized controlled trial support to offer the patient progesterone or HCG. Please don't 
use HCG for lateral phase support at all. Because uh, if you use HCG, it will have a prolonged eutrophic effect for six days or more. And this will lead to ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So we have to focus on progesterone, putting in mind there is no randomized control trial to uh, define its rule. But for all cases of IVF XD, we must give progesterone. This is not related to the American Fertility Society recommendation. We must give progesterone for all IVF XD cycles. Why? To fill the gap between the effect of triggering HCG and the HCG comes from the embryo after implantation. In this gap, the progesterone level will decline and so abortion will occur. So we give progesterone mandatory for all cases of IVF XZ. Timing is variable according to publications. I don't have time to discuss it. So progesterone, we have intramuscular progesterone, oral progesterone, vaginal progesterone, uh, rectal progesterone, subcutaneous or combination. And regarding vaginal, we have gel, cream, pessaris, tablets, and so on. All of us know the different, uh, different uh, progesterone in the market. And regarding oral progesterone, we have uh, uh, we have natural micronized progesterone capsule or bedrogesterone. The natural oral progesterone capsule is not recommended for oral use. This is a recent recommendation. Why? Because it has low bioavailability. We use high dose up to 200, up to 400 milligrams of it with high rate of side effects. Uh, but dendrogesterone has higher bioavailability. So we use 10 milligram up to 30 milligram. So this is one to 400 milligram and this is 10 to 30 milligram due to high bioavailability of dendrogesterone and lower dose. And the recommendation is that this progesterone has become the new standard for retail phase support and fresh embryo transfer in a daily dose of 30 milligram as found in this publication, Fertility Serenity. Again, another study comparing it to vaginal cream or pessaris found uh, comparable uh, live births and ongoing pregnancy rate. Again, many studies comparing it to different approaches of vaginal uh, uh, progesterone found similar results. So in conclusion of this uh, part of uh, role of progesterone, the HCG is not recommended. Oral micronized progesterone is not recommended. The intramuscular, vaginal, and subcutaneous have comparable results, and oral progesterone is a promising drug as recommended by the ISHRI, uh, as it is approved for lateral phase support in, uh, uh, in ART. In conclusion of this lecture, I'm sorry for being long, in conclusion, I have to say that endometrial factor of infertility is a very important to be put in mind when you are treating a case of infertility and endometrial receptivity can be assessed by simple ways, including transvaginal sonography, including uh, serum progesterone, the ovulatory, as I told you, and hysteroscopy. Regardless of its type, the progesterone is essential for all cases of induced cycles and oral dendrogesterone is a promising drug for improving endometrial receptivity and thank you very much. If you need to see this lecture or other lectures, you can go to the YouTube channel at Dot Darush. You'll find many lectures related to all aspects of OBGYN. Thank you very much. Uh, if, if, if you have any questions or comments, I are very much welcome. No questions? So it's clear or boring? That's okay. Uh, I told you uh, if you find fake medium, you will cancel the cycle and start treatment for the patient, subsequent cycles. You can prescribe this to Actually, I have a lecture on hormones in normal and uh, new cycles. It's the wrong lecture. But in short, you can try estrogen oral or gels or injection or patches. But the conclusion of the studies, uh, these studies are not so strong, but practically we use estrogen to improve the material thickness and then we make transfer of the embryos later on.
Of course, not all cases of endometrium are easy to be treated. This is number one. Number two, your patient was uh, 41 years old, and of course, uh, after 40 years, the probability of having uh, normal uh, physiologic appearance of the body is different from young patients. Thirdly, endometrial scratching has been criticized in many publications, and last conclusion is uh, not valuable. Fourthly, if we do hysteroscopy for this patient, we, uh, we have to uh, ask if they took endometrial sample for uh, assessing endometritis or not. Endometritis is a common, as a common finding, but unfortunately it is neglected by doctors. So if you do hysteroscopy for this case, take an endometrial sample. I remember one patient, I took an endometrial sample, and it was proved to be tuberculosis. So we don't have to ignore sampling with the hysteroscopy. Not only looking at the implantation site, which is five millimeter from the fundus, take a sample from the endometrium to assess the infection, inflammation, and so on. And treatment of any infection, PID or bacterial genosis, this is valuable for receptivity. Regarding the thickness itself, I told uh, our colleagues that the treatment by estrogen, different applications of different forms, and different doses of estrogen. Some studies use high dose of estrogen, but the conclusion of these studies, they are trials. No evidence-based suggestions that estrogen will improve endometrial symptoms or endometrial thickness. As I mean. So some patients, some category of patients will have this problem. And if you treat her and find it five millimeter, you have to sit down with her and her husband, tell them after all these lines of treatment, your endometrium is just five millimeter. What to do? Would you like to uh, make transfer or to wait some time and you can change the protocol and so on? That's all. Yes, uh, there was a, one slide, but I, I skipped it in a, in a rapid way. One slide, uh, uh, publication in fertility rate on use of doxycycline, of course, for this lady. Doxycycline was tried for treating chronic endometritis. And actually, I used it for 14 days for this lady. And sometimes uh, I, I had another type of antibiotic to treat uh, chronic endometritis. And if, by the way, we can. Uh, also, we don't have to ignore but the talk on endometrial only. The, I have a lecture on uterine factor of infertility, and there is chronic myotrites as a cause of infertility, and uh, we can diagnose it by Doppler ultrasound as well. I have some slides on this. So, treatment of chronic endometrites and chronic myotrites is very important if you put it in your mind. I, I saw a lot of cases with abnormal tribe bleeding, for example, treated by doctors as hormonal treatment, hormonal treatment. They don't make Doppler for this uterus, and to see the vasculature of the uterus and changes of the indices and so on, we can diagnose infection of the uterus as a cause of bleeding, for example. So we have to put it in mind, acute endometritis and chronic endometritis and myometritis at the same time. So there is a role for the ultrasound of the doctor diagnosed myometritis. Uh, re regarding endometrites, I read that uh, the three-dimensional ultrasound 
uh, they use, uh, I did not do three-dimensional study for patients with abnormal endometrium, but uh, they uh, make Doppler for the spiral arteries of the endometrium and show the indices in the spiral arteries of the endometrium, but they are very small studies, not uh, so strong to make some recommendation for them. But generally speaking, if it is acute, it is a part of PID, so the patient will have pain and so on. If it is chronic, you can do hysteroscopy and see the strawberry appearance and micropolypar. Doctor, how about using uh, experimentally uh, giving a uh, dose of antibiotic for every single infertility patient instead of doing biopsy and all? Um, My idea, because uh, not all patients would accept uh, to do biopsy, mm -hmm. so what about if you give the doxycycline in the first site? part of the cycle for every single patient. Yes, of course, doxycycline is valuable for uh, for trichomonas, for uh, PID, uh, and it's recommended by CDC for uh, treatment of uh, chlamydia and so on. But, uh, 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 and, uh, but I, I think uh, empiric use of this treatment will be good, but will not be, uh, uh, if you find endometriosis, you have to treat it promptly. The course is just one week, uh, doxycycline. You know, doxycycline carries side effects, and the patients are not satisfied with this treatment. Uh, you what do. about the target of mycoplasma and urea plasma? These are affected easily by doxycycline. Yes. And what about this one? It will be three days dose. Yes, okay. We can uh, we proceed can to empiric one. treatment. Less than one. Yes, empiric treatment for the couple. This is good approach, practical approach. Uh, not waiting to biopsy, but the, when we are focusing on a patient with failures of IVF, okay. she needs documents that you have endometriosis. I took a biopsy and showed you have endometriosis. But the population of infertility, you can proceed. But this patient is angry because she paid a lot of money and no baby. This is a problem. We have to give her. If we mention you will take three days course of doxycycline, she says why you didn't give it to me from the start. I would like to thank you very much for your uh, kind uh, and comprehensive lecture. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the time is time uh, a little bit growing. late. Yes. If you want, we can keep discussing and uh, we can delay my lecture to the other week. Okay. Because uh, otherwise we have to proceed to the second lecture. Otherwise, no lunch. <laughs> <laughs> ah, no, uh, definitely lunch. Lunch is very important. Nutrition of the of the body. Okay. Thank you very much. السلام عليكم سامعين شيء؟ ماي ماي ساوند از اوكي نعم السلام عليكم ورحمه الله